quick, go get your family, bring everybody together. We're going to talk about some things for the family right here on book, chapter, and verse. I'm Jeff Archie. Thank you for joining me today on Book, Chapter, and Verse. I appreciate you taking time with us today to study some things pertaining to the wonderful words of life, the Holy Bible. Let us examine book, chapter, and verse on the subjects before us, and you are more than welcome to join us each and every time we study together. Please know that at the end of our broadcast, we will be offering Bible study material absolutely free so that you may continue these studies in the privacy of your own home. So please stay tuned as we continue our study, book, chapter, and verse. Today I want us to consider one verse from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, and verse 24. It's a part of a parable Jesus teaches about the wise man and the foolish man. You may know this story, this parable, by the singing of the wise man that built his house upon the rock and the foolish man that built his house on the sand. In this section of Matthew 7, 24, Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. Who will ever hear these sayings of mine and will do them? You know, it is a blessing for me to preach regularly. And over the years, I have served in various areas within the church. I have learned a few lessons about families. First of all, families tend to allow small things to deteriorate into big things. What might be just a small thing in a family, nothing major, can sometime erupt into a larger matter. And you know, if the small things are addressed, the bigger things could be avoided. I've noted that in families. The second thing, by the time it is agreed to, quote, unquote, talk to someone, sadly, things are at the point that things cannot be repaired. And that takes us back to point number one, addressing matters when they come. Sometimes I've seen individuals get to a point that when they want or need to talk to someone, sometimes things are beyond repair, and that's tragic. I would say this. I've learned this too within the church, with families. Third thing, if you see a brother or a sister in Christ struggling with a home life, move quickly, inquire carefully, pray fervently, and seek assistance. I like to put it this way. If we are proactive instead of reactive, it will help us and others to remain active. That's true. If we are proactive instead of reactive, it will help us and others to remain active. Here's the fourth thing I've learned about families through my years in preaching. Busy children and teenagers create the family schedule. And too many times, God is not booked within it. Now it starts innocently, but Satan will commit to it. Children and teenagers will want to get involved in every sport, every activity, every event to where parents are running them every which way. Or if I've had parents tell me, children make our schedules, but we can get so busy and God gets pushed out. Don't be deceived. Satan will take advantage of it. Here's another thing I've learned in working with families. On the other hand, there are not many things that are more sad than children that want to go to Bible school and church and mamas and daddies fail to follow up. 
children that would love to go, children that love Bible class, children that enjoy it, and mamas and daddies will not commit to getting their children to Bible school or church. I've learned that too. Here's another thing I've learned about families. Forsaking the assembly together, families not attending worship, is a seed that is sown toward reaping an unfaithful family. If the entire family stays away from church, and I've learned this in my preaching and ministry, if they stay away and fail to go, it is sowing seeds toward an unfaithful family. Here's the next thing I've learned about families from preaching. Never underestimate your influence. If there is one that is faithful in the household, there is a chance. But if one is less active and non-committal to faithful attendance, your chance and opportunities dwindle tremendously. That's sad. If there's one person, for example, if there is a wife or a mother that will attend worship, but the husband doesn't and the children fail not to for whatever might be reason, there is still that one chance. But if she pulls away, it's going to hurt everyone even more. Are these things causing unnecessary struggles within our families? I mean, these are things that I have just observed from my years in preaching. And folks, they are so eerie and scary because they're so true. You know, some time back, I was reading some material concerning 30 plus years of research dealing with 24,000 families. And the survey was designed to ask, what makes families strong? From this reading, six qualities rose to the top. And the more that I looked at them, I said they are good biblical qualities worthy for us to adapt. And if we will put these qualities to work. So let us consider in this broadcast six biblical principles for your family. I'll share three today. And I'll share three on our next episode. And it's time, families, in this world, it's time to rise up and say, let's fight back. The family is precious to God. Here we go. Number one. The first thing that I noted from this study is to communicate with each other. Here's a quote that I noted from the study. These families spent time talking with each other. They also listened well, which shows respect. Folks, listening and speaking equal great communication. Look at this text of Isaiah 15 and verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. You see, listening, speaking, hearing, all in communication. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 3, 9 and 10 of the conversation of Eli to Samuel. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Notice the exhortation and command of James in James 1.19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, Slow to speak. You know, th th that one I need to really work on. Swift to hear, slow to speak. Two ears, one mouth. And adjust accordingly, as they say. So learning and speaking 
is a tremendous way to communicate. Learning or listening. Here's number two. Not only listen, but loving and speaking. Interest in listening to others reflects a healthy sense of self. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now Galatians 5, 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So listening and loving helps in communication. That's awesome. Communication is vitally important if we listen to the one that we love. There are the occasions that my beloved bride, my wife, will talk to me. And I've tried to grow in putting the paper aside or the iPhone and turning to her and looking at her because I love her and I want to listen. So many times we find the iPhones and the texting taking our place of good, true communication. And mamas and daddies, sometimes there's a time for boys and girls to put the phones down and for moms and dads to put the phones down and increase our communication. I noticed this trend in reading this study. Families need to communicate, talk, and enjoy those times together. But let's look at our second one. Not only should we communicate, but number two, complementary to each other. Enhance the communication by complementing. Again, this study of the 24,000 strong families, look at this. Family members gave one another compliments and sincere demonstrations of approval. They tried to make others feel appreciated and good about themselves. You know, I was reading of another study that expressed how men crave affection, but not necessarily intimacy, and the study showed actually more than women. You know, men love feeling special and noticed by their wives. And that's even true for the whole family. A simple compliment, saying something very nice, saying something gracious. I love you. You mean a lot to me. That's a great job in complimenting and encouraging. Listen to Paul in Philippians chapter 2, 2 through 4. And look at this biblical principle based on complimenting. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In Matthew 7 and verse 12, think about that golden rule. And how the golden rule would be so true even within a marriage. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, let's try something here. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that your wife should do to you, you do unto her. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that your husband do to you, you do unto him. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that parents should do to you, you do unto them. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that children should do to you, you do unto them. If we thought on others and looked at others' point of view, that truly would complement Let's consider a book chapter and verse here of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. I would refer in this area of complimenting that we practice Peter's principle. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing 
knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. Now, looking at this, when we're of one mind, that's mean we're thinking together. When we're compassionate, we're responding together. When we love unconditionally, we're loving together. When we have pity, we're understanding together. When we're courteous, we're expressing together. And when we don't seek to get even, we're forgiving together. Practice Peter's principle in thinking, responding, loving, understanding, expressing, and forgiving. You know, that right there would be another broadcast down the road, so you never know. That's why you should tune in each week. Let's look at this third principle for families. Commitment to each other. There's communication. There's compliment. But there's a commitment. Look at this quote about the 24,000 strong families from this study. Look at this quote. Families promoted each person's happiness and welfare, invested time and energy in each other, and made family their number one priority. Well, this makes sense. For communication and compliments were the norm, so this part right here makes very good sense. And as we think along those lines, how important it is. I would submit to you there's a priority of family because of a priority of Christ. For example, in the marriage We understand that man and woman are to be one, so there's a oneness. In Matthew 19, 5, how man and woman are to be one flesh. There's a oneness and there's a priority in that family. There's a commitment, we're going to make this work. Remember, everybody is laboring and working together for the best. There's a victorious attitude. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Going back to Proverbs 29, 18, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Meaning that vision, that sight is to be bathed by the love or the law of God that we follow. Now you put all that together, that's where a family needs that strong, solid commitment. Family needs to be committed together. That with that commitment, and you know with Christ as the first priority, as we're taught in Matthew 6, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. With Christ the first priority, everything else falls right in place. He is the no when we need it and the yes to keep us going. I think of it this way. It's just like a hub in a wheel. If Christ is the hub in the center of our wheel, everything else turns perfectly. And so when we think about the idea of communicate, compliment, and commitment, when we put all these things together, how important it is to see that these are great biblical principles that will help our families. Let's try this. Beginning today, let's just improve our communication just a little. Let's start complimenting one another more. And let's commit to our family and say, hey, let's work on a little bit and let's make this happen. Try this. You've gathered together this evening and you're listening to this broadcast together. What would be wrong if you took other evenings and just sat down and took the Bible and studied together? What if we were to just take just a few moments to just open the Bible, to put aside any type of a distraction or anything that might be, and just take a few moments? And somebody said, well, I wouldn't know where to begin. Try this. What if you just say simply opened to the Psalms of the Old Testament? 
and take a look at Psalm 1 and verse 1 and maybe look over and ask one of your children to simply read that psalm. Or verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. What if you were to read that and read all of that text and just say, here's what this means to me. Now, we all have to communicate here. Tell me what this means to you. And then turn around and compliment one another because you may see a quality there that that person has. And then build on that commitment. Put aside the cell phones, the iPhones, all the other mass media that we have. And let's put Christ as the first priority in our families. Let's communicate, compliment, and commit. And if Christ is our first priority, then there will be communication. There will be a compliment, and there will be a commitment. Here is a plea that I would make to you today. With that first priority, maybe it is time that we involve God more in our lives. And you know, when we learn about His church that we read of in the New Testament, and we learn how one is obedient to the gospel of Christ, then we're mindful of how beautiful it is that we can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine if every family was obedient to the gospel of Christ, put Christ first in their lives, and built on that with every decision they would make. Divorce rates would plummet. Children and trouble would be far from them. There wouldn't be a drug problem. There wouldn't be an alcohol problem. There wouldn't be a morality problem. People would cease living together out of marriage. People would understand God's plan. And if every member of the family would commit to God's plan, imagine how greater those families would be. Beloved friend, I've seen it. And I've seen when families pull away from God, it causes a spiritual dysfunction that shouldn't be. That's why if every member of the family, and I'm not speaking of our smaller ones that don't understand, but those of us that do, will be obedient to the gospel of Christ by believing it with all of our heart, repenting of our sins and confessing Christ as the Son of God and being buried with Him in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins. Added to the church we read of in the New Testament and raised to walk in newness of life, a life that is new and we all work together. And we communicate godly things and we compliment one another, urging each other to heaven. And we keep a commitment that little Johnny, little Susie, mom and dad know their commitment is not to cause one another trouble or strife, but to be a family of God. I hope you'll make that decision this day for your families. I truly do. Because on the other hand, families that I have seen that keep the Lord as that hub in their will have life turned for them that is of help, that is of courage, and that is of strength. Your family can have that. Come together and study on these matters. Permit me at this moment to extend a thank you to David Sargent in an article that he penned called Strong Families, to which he referred to a study over a period of years done by John Dufresne and Nick Stinnett. And I am grateful for the studies that have been brought forth in this broadcast. I'm grateful for an article called Five Secrets to a Happy Marriage that's written by Sarah Weir and to my brother and friend Sammy Jones of a marriage enrichment seminar that my wife and I attended. I'm grateful to extend credit and if any of these things can help you, contact us and we'll be glad to share that with you. Let's pause and enjoy this beautiful hymn as we continue our study and I'll be right back. Morning when this life is over, I'll fly, fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial. 
west to shore. These three biblical principles we talked about today, we trust will help you and your family. But next time, we're going to look at three more. See you then on book, chapter, and verse.